Well, we're going to talk about a subject that some of you will never really deal with, but lots of you will. And that's talking to people who say that the God of the Bible is an evil God because he had the Hebrew soldiers go into the land of Canaan and kill all kinds of people. And I'm not going to give the final answer on this. I'm only going to give what I understand from the Bible. And I want you to, this is what you need to know. What I'm going to give you is I'm not making excuses for God in this. I'm telling you, what does the Bible say about God in genocide? And here's what the Bible says. The word genocide means to destroy an entire race of people or an entire culture of people or an entire tribe of people or an entire caste of people. And the genocide was that God commanded Moses, um, well, actually Joshua, and the Israelites to go into the land and to kill all of these people. And he really did do it. So let's go. How can Christians believe in the God of the Bible, which portrays him to be a cruel God, commanded the Hebrews to commit genocide? Very, very common, very, very common attack against Christianity. Now, the number one attack against Christianity by atheists is the whole thing about science and um, just the fact that you know that how can you believe in a God that exists that's, who allows suffering in the world? So, this is kind of related to that one. If you think about it, it's related because it's dealing with the question of. How can the God of the Bible be a good God when he commanded Hebrews to commit genocide? And just to make sure, he did. So Israel made a vow to the Lord and said, if you will indeed deliver this people into my hand, then I will utterly destroy their cities. The Lord heard the voice of Israel, delivered up the Canaanites, then they utterly destroyed them in their cities. The name of that place was called Hormah. And so this is this is before they left the wilderness. This is when they're still wandering in the wilderness after they left Egypt. And the people here, Israel, is all of the Hebrew people, the descendants of Isaac um, and Jacob. Wow. Kill all of the Canaanites. And listen to what God commands in Deuteronomy 20, verses 17 and 18. Completely destroy all the people, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, the Jebusites, as the Lord ordered you to do kill them so they will not make you sin against the lord by teaching you to do all the disgusting things that they do in the worship of their gods now it doesn't say make them leave the land that's not what it says it says kill them k-i-l-l -L. put them to death no matter what you want to say god commanded the hebrews kill the people who were living in the land of Canaan, all right? So let, let me just go back over the story, just so you understand the story. God told Abraham, 400 years before this, he told Abraham, Abraham, I'm going to give you the land of Canaan. It's going to be all yours. So you're going to have that land. Then Abraham's grandson, um, Jacob, he and, when he, he, he and 70 of his family, they left the promised land of Canaan and they went to Egypt. And there in Egypt, that's because of Joseph and that story. You probably should know that story. And they were there in Egypt 400 years. You know, obviously Jacob died and everything. And then they came back. And when they're on the borders, God says, completely destroy all the people who are living in the land of Canaan. That's the land that God had promised Abraham. Destroy them all. All right. If God is loving, how could he just, how could he command Israel to execute all of these people? After all, Jesus said, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Jesus said, love your enemies. I think he probably meant don't kill them. That seems to be sort of kind of understandable. How does a Christian answer this question? How can God, who said, love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you. How can this Christian God command the Hebrews to kill all the people? So what I'm going to do, the goal for today's lecture is to have 
a firm understanding of the Bible's description of God's character as holy and righteous. And I can promise you, it's really hard to get this into our brains. Uh, even, even in Pakistan, I think in Pakistan it's easier than it would be in the U.S. But it's hard to get into our brains that God is holy. And that's who he is. Answer one, God is a holy God who punishes sin. Jesus said, the one who believes in the Son has eternal life, but the one who refuses to believe in the Son will not see life. Instead, the wrath of God remains in him. This word wrath means God's anger that pours out judgment. So Jesus is saying here that the one who believes in the Son, God the Son, has eternal life. But the one who refuses to believe in the Son, God the Son, will not see life. Instead, the wrath of God remains in him. God's going to pour out his judging anger on the person who does not believe in the Son. So God is a holy God. He punishes sin. Let's do what Jesus said. I have come to cast fire upon the earth. How I wish it were already kindled. Fire is talking about judgment. Absolutely, without any question, it's judgment. But I have a baptism to undergo, and how distressed I am until it is accomplished. Do you suppose that I came to grant peace on earth? I tell you no, but rather division. For from now on, five members of one household will be divided, three against two and two against three. Now, when he talks about the dividedness of the household, what he's talking about is the fact that he came into the earth knowing that in a family, that if there are five people in the family, that some of those people are going to believe in Jesus and follow him, and some are not. And the people who don't are actually going to persecute the people who do, which we see happening all the time. Somebody converts to Christianity, and the family comes together against that person. That's what Jesus is talking about. But the first verse, I have come to cast fire on the earth. That's judgment. Jesus came to cast fire on the earth. And so he wanted to see the earth judged. Why? Because God is a holy God who punishes sin. He punishes sin. Now, what is this? God's punishment? Death is God's punishment for humanity's rebellion. Us. But death means a lot of things. Um, in the end, death means hell. Paul, I mean, John says it's the second death. And that is almost definitely an eternity of being aware of God's punishment and being under God's punishment for eternity. As far as we can figure out, you're awake and aware every single day of your existence throughout all eternity. That sounds like what hell is. Do you understand hell? No, I don't understand hell. I don't even understand it a little bit, but I believe it. Too many verses that, that say it. You can't choose your, um, your doctrines to believe. Now, God warned Adam and Eve that if they ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, they would die. I mean, it was just, just out and out warning. The Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree of the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for in the day you eat from it, you will die. Now, I, I, you already know this, but I just want to make sure you get it. All of you forever and ever and ever recognize the fact that God created this universe that we live in. Remember, we talked about God. He is not a part of our dimension in the way that we can understand that God's relationship to time and space is different from ours and all of that, that God dwells in his own dimension. It's his dimension. But God made this world, this dimension of existence that you and I live in, that we're just sitting in right now. God made this, uh, this um, area of existence, dimension, so that there are consequences. So that if you push, something's going to push back. And if you sin, God will judge us. If you sin, there are consequences. Now, I, and the consequences are more than just God judging. They include God's judgment. That's the worst part. But there are consequences. Eve sinned. The consequence of Eve's sin was she tried to influence her husband also to sin. 
And the consequence of his sin was the fact that all of their children and all of their children's children and all of their children's children's children, all the way to today, this afternoon, this evening, this year, all of Adam and Eve's children, all of us sin, all of us die. So there are consequences. If you sin, you die. And God warned Adam and Eve that that's what was going to happen. So through them, death entered the world, and it comes to every human being. Death is God's judgment for sin. It's the consequence of sin. Because of Adam, every human being must die, period. And the thing, you know, people say, oh, what about innocent babies? Babies die too, don't they? Babies die too. That's a consequence of human sin. Even babies die. It's universal. Which means it's not simply the fact that, oh, well, if you sin, you will die. Yes. But also because of Adam, every human being must die anyway. God ends the life of every human being according to his divine plan and timing. Some people, God takes the disease. So he can say, okay, well, you're going to die from a disease, COVID-19. Um, others through accidents, car accidents, accidents in farming, all kinds of different accidents in the world. Old age, which is like a really bad way to die, by the way. It's not a good way to die. It's a bad way to die. And even violence by the humans. I mean, sometimes God says, it's time for that person to die. And that person is going to die in a war. That person's going to die by being robbed and shot. That person's going to die by being stabbed. That's one of the ways people die. And God doesn't make the, the thief kill the person. He just lets them do what he knows they will do. God doesn't make a war to happen. He doesn't make a war to happen. He just lets people be as sinful as he knows they will be. He knows exactly what they're going to do. God already knows the future. There are no surprises to God. And he knows that if God simply allows a person to do, they will. And God punishes all humans for the rebellion by ending their lives, by putting them to death. Yes. That's not even talking about hell, which is a whole bigger subject. But God punishes all human beings for the rebellion by ending their lives. God chose to end the lives of the Canaanites through war and battle. Now, the Canaanite people, he was planning on judging them, but he decided that he was going to end their lives as his judgment through battle. Could have been through old age. Could have been through COVID-19. Would have been COVID negative 157, but it could have been. He could have done whatever he wanted to do to end the lives of the Canaanites, but God says they were going to die through war and battle. And God had told Abraham, Hundreds of years before, he was going to punish the people of Canaan. It will be four generations before your descendants come back here. See this? Because I will not drive out the Amorites until they become so wicked they must be punished. If you don't understand what this is saying, here is a simple explanation of it. 400 years before, more than 400 years before, God sent Joshua and the children of Israel to cross the Jordan River, come into the land of Canaan, and kill everybody in the land. 400 years before that, God had told Abraham, this is going to happen. In 400 years, four generations, your descendants are going to come back to Canaan. They're going to be in Egypt for 400 years. And when they leave Egypt, they're coming back to Canaan. And the people in Canaan are not quite ready for judgment yet. But they will be. Because they are so wicked. And his appointed way of ending their lives could have been a famine or a plague. Instead, he appointed the Hebrews to carry out his decision. And I, let me explain something so you all understand it, because it's, it's something that you may never have thought about before. It's very possible. God judges in different ways. God judges also on different scales. Now, let me explain. Here, God is judging nations of people well god also judges individuals he's judging all of the people who are about to die he's judging them individually 
but he's also judging the whole nation. And his way of judging the whole nation is sending the Israelites with their swords and spears and knives into the land of Canaan and kill them all. He's judging the nation. Their sin was not quite enough when God and Abraham were talking about that 400 years before, but now their sin is enough. I, I would just tell you that having studied the book of Revelation, you need to know that God not only judges people, you, know, you me, he also judges nations. And a nation that is living in sin and in rebellion and idolatry, a nation which is in rebellion against God, they think, oh, we can do this as long as we want. God doesn't care. God doesn't see. God doesn't judge. But he will judge in the end. I know that from the book of Revelation because the book of Revelation has judgment after judgment after judgment after judgment of nation after nation after nation after nation. He is judging the nations. I read the, the Old Testament prophets. They talk about God's plan to judge the nations. And it's, you know, like Babylon, Assyria, Persia. God says they have done what they have done. I'm bringing to the nation of Tyre and Sidon. I'm bringing my judgment. I'm judging them for what they do. All people die in the end because of sin. Yes. All people die in the end because of sin. Absolutely. But even nations are punished by God. Could be by famine or plague or disease. It could be by war. But every nation is judged by God. And so in this case, the Canaanites were judged by God. God chose to use the Hebrews to judge the people of Canaan. He can choose whoever he wants to. And he does. Now some people do not approve of this description of what God is like. Let me move this out of the way just a little bit. Yeah, you can figure out what that's saying. Some people do not approve of the description of what God is like. People do not like a think about a God who punishes his sinful creation. I, mean, I think Pakistanis can handle that a little bit better than Americans can, Brits. I, I think that people have a hard time in America believing that God punishes his creation, but he does. Part of that reason is when they were kids growing up, they thought of God as sort of like Santa Claus. God is not like Santa Claus. He's a righteous God. He's a holy God. He punishes those who sin. And people don't like that. So the number one disproof that God doesn't exist is how can God be good and all-powerful and yet there be suffering in the world? Well, that's easy to answer because God's a righteous and holy God. And that God who is good and that God who is only Holy is also a God who punishes sin. And the world is in rebellion against God. The world is sinning against God. So God's got to judge it. You, you can't walk away from God and say, oh, no, no, uh, you're, you only can be nice. You can't be judging. Can't be full of wrath. You can't execute people. God's like, no, I'm holy and I do what I do. People don't like that. People argue that the God of the Bible doesn't exist because they think that a good God, move this down, that a good God can punish sinners. They do not think, what is that? They do not think that a good God can punish sinners. That's irrational. That doesn't make any sense. Oh, I don't believe that God exists because I don't think a good God punishes sinners. That's, that's irrational because he does does i mean i mean we have a ton of evidence that the god of the bible exists we have the prophecies we, we did a little bit of the prophecies already the, the what we did with the prophecies just so far is enough to show you that that god really exists because no one could make that kind of prediction but well, there's the evidence from the created world itself it's all over the place in the created world that god exists you have to choose not to believe in god as like a religion almost. You have to say, oh, no, I'm not going to believe. I'm not going to believe. You know, better, better close your ears. Close your eyes. I'm not going to believe. I'm not going to believe. I'm not going to. Because the, the evidence is everywhere. My wife and I walk in the beach. 
We see the ocean. We see the fish. We see the birds in the sky. We see the, the beauty in the, in the creation of the sky. We see the sunset. We see the stars at night. We see the moon over the ocean. You cannot tell me that there's no God. There's evidence from the created world that there's a God who's great and intelligent and amazing. DNA, you're going to find out in this course that DNA is incredible evidence that there is somebody who has information, someone, not just blind chance. So it's irrational to say, oh, well, there can't be a good God who punishes sinners. Therefore, God doesn't exist because there's too much evidence that the God of the Bible is real. Prophecies, resurrection, I didn't say anything about that. You'll see in this course how much evidence there is that the resurrection is real. And there certainly is evidence that the God of the Bible punishes sin. There's evidence from prophecies, lots. There's evidence from Christ's teachings, lots. And there's also evidence from our world. If there is a God, if he's the God of the Bible, if the prophecies prove that the God of the Bible is truly God, who is not governed by time, not governed by space, who is all powerful, and he judges sin, if we see that, we just have to look at our world and say, the reason why this world is so messed up is we are under God's judgment. You don't have to figure things out. The reason why the world is filled with suffering and with discouragement and with hatred and all of that stuff is God is judging the world. And often God judges the world through diseases like COVID-19. And often God judges the world by allowing bad people to do what they normally do, bad things. That's how he judges the world. Philosophers don't like the kind of God who punishes sinners. But the evidence is convincing that God is real. And so you may not like it. But just because you don't like it doesn't mean that you can ignore it. I'm going to skip this example because it's probably not a good one. I was in it. That was weird. God is the holy God who punishes sin. You may not like this description of God, but we can't reject God because we do not like what he does. Uh, well, what is that? How does that work? How can you say, you know, I don't like you, therefore you don't exist? Yeah, you, know, you can't do that with your next door neighbor. You can't, a wife can't do that with her husband, you know? She can't say, you know what? I don't like you, therefore you don't exist. I and mean, he goes on talking to her, and you don't exist. I don't, I, don't, I don't like you. It doesn't work. So, how come people can say, I don't like God? I don't like a God who punishes sin. I don't like a God who allows suffering in the world. How can people say, because I don't like you, God, therefore you don't exist? That's not rational. That doesn't make any sense. It's, it, you can't live that way. But you got to remember, this is a big got to remember here. This is the holy God who sent his son to die for humanity's sins. Now that's not a little thing. That's an enormous thing. So it's almost like, what you might call disjunction. A disjunction is when you have something that seems to be like completely turning something that you believe upside down. God's a holy God who judges sin, and he sent God the Son into the world to bear the sins of the world and to pour all of his anger on him. You go, wait a minute. How can God be a holy God? How can God judge sin and yet do the cross? How, how does that work? And the answer to that is, he is an unlimited holy God who has unlimited holiness and unlimited righteousness and unlimited love. You can't stop him from loving. There's no beginning to his love. There's no end to his love. The Bible says God's love extends to the heavens. His faithful, faithfulness reaches to the skies. You know, you walk outside. You know, on Lahore, sometimes that's hard because, you know, there's all these buildings and stuff. But go to FC College campus and just go out on the cricket field and just lay on the grass and look up at the sky and see how enormous that sky is. God's loving kindness extends all the way into outer space, all the way to, through the eternity, all the way to the 
ends of the universe and beyond. His, that's his love. It's just filled with his love. It's also filled with his righteousness that way. It's also filled with his holiness that way too. So you can't say, oh, well, it's impossible that a God who is so wrathful and holy and righteous would also be so loving as to send his son. No, it's not impossible. Not expected, but it's not impossible. But it is odd. The materialists, remember a materialist? We, we talked about what materialism is. If you don't know what it is, go back to that lecture and please watch the videos, the two videos on materialism, because I think they help a little bit. It is odd that materialists dislike God because he committed genocide. They say, oh, well, this is wrong that God committed genocide because God sent the Hebrews in to kill all the Canaanites. That's morally wrong. You're like, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, time out. Let's, let's do a little thinking here. Materialists don't believe that humans are any more than just things produced by chance evolution. They don't even think that humans are real. They think that humans are things. They are biological robots. That's what humans think. That's what materialists think humans are. Materialists believe that morality is a result of random chance mutation. In, in our video about the robot, that robot was carefully planned by the computer programmer. And so everything the robot did was planned by the programmer. Um, but according to materialists, everything that exists happened by random chance evolution with the survival of the fittest being the, the mechanism that was used to take that which works and keep it when that which doesn't work and eliminates it. Mosquitoes and cockroaches are also the result of random chance evolution. So humans are the chance of random chance evolution. Mosquitoes are the chan are a random chance evolution. And any being that exists solely because of random chance mutations is a something, not a someone. You can't be someone if you were created randomly. You can only be someone if you're a person. You can only be a person if you're in the image of God. Materialists believe that right or wrong are only what we believe because we've evolved to have these feelings. Materialists don't believe there's any true right and wrong. Don't. <coughs> you wouldn't know that because materialists go to rallies and they protest things and they say, oh, this is wrong, this is wrong. But that's completely hypocritical because they don't believe there is a right and wrong because everything's transmutation, just happened and it happened. That's all there is. So how can they say that the Hebrews killing all the Canaanites is, is any more wrong than killing a bunch of cockroaches? And I will say that there are lots of people in the world who say that it's wrong to kill a bunch of cockroaches. Why? Because they have just as much right to live as I do. Yes, but they don't have the right to live in my house. Sorry, that's what poison's all about. That's what Dubai is all about. So let's not do that. Atheists believe, I'd say probably 98% of atheists believe that it's not wrong to do abortion of babies. Yeah, I would say that's pretty much everywhere. They argue that the mother has the right over her own body. And that's fake, by the way. They don't really believe that. They don't believe anybody has any rights over anything because nobody's really someone. But the reason why it's okay to abort those babies is because the baby doesn't have any rights. Why? Because the baby is not any different than any other biological material. If it's a mother's gallbladder, take it out, take it out, get rid of it. She doesn't need her gallbladder, then get rid of it. If it's the mother's, well, what is, what is tonsils, take them out. You don't need them. Hair, cut it off. It's okay. It's fine. Why? Because those things don't have any right to existence. Neither does a baby. In fact, in America, they don't really think it's wrong even to kill a baby after it's been born in certain circumstances. If it's not wrong to kill millions of babies every year, um, if it's not wrong to kill, it's like 600,000 a year in America. If it's not wrong to kill millions of babies every year, why would they care if God executes people? What is different between abort what abortionists do and what the nation of Israel did? What abortionists do, they do so that people can have sex. That's what that is. And I would say that, generally speaking, got to just be honest about because that's what it's all about. Abortions happen in America 
because people want to have sex, but they don't want to have babies. The difference is that God was judging the Canaanites because the Canaanites were sinful. What abortionists do, they don't have the right to do because they're not God. Secondly, they don't have the right to do it because those babies haven't sinned. They have no right because they are not executing God's judgment on those babies. They're actually giving their parents an excuse to continue to have sex without the consequences. But their consequences are coming, I promise you. You can't abort babies in a nation like the United States where 600,000 600, babies are aborted every year. You can't do that and expect that God's going to go, oh, it's okay, don't worry about it. It's okay, it's okay. I won't watch. In reality, humans are made in God's image. They are not random chance beings. That's the fact. Human beings are not just like cockroaches and mosquitoes. They are God's image bearers. God requires his image bearers to love him and to love other image bearers. It's illogical, whoops, it's illogical for materials to say there's such a thing as right and wrong. So this whole thing is saying, oh, it's so wrong, you know, God, God told the Hebrews to go into the promised land and to kill all these people. It's just totally wrong that they do that. That's just, it's ridiculous because they don't believe in right and wrong. They don't believe there is such a thing as a, as a person. Materialists don't believe in persons. Atheists don't believe that persons are real. But they, they do believe that persons are real, practically speaking, because they can't be consistent. But if they're consistent at all, if they're evolutionists at all, I just read something yesterday. It's like, oh my gosh. This, this uh, it was a science article and it was trying to argue the fact that we really aren't persons, that, they, that there isn't really a right and wrong. There isn't really, you know, there isn't really such a thing as beauty. There isn't such a thing as love. That that's just all our imagination. Where do they come up with this? Well, it, it's, it's this, this belief that everything has happened by chance. And the only thing in the universe is material. But it's not true. It's not true. Morality is not simply random chance. Because there's a moral God. And that moral God judges the world. And that moral God judges individuals. And that moral God says, you cannot commit adultery. You cannot steal. You cannot lie. You cannot murder. You cannot covet your neighbor's wife or your neighbor's dog or your neighbor's cow or your neighbor's plow or your neighbor's field or house. And God says, you must love God with all of your heart and all of your soul and all of your mind. You must love your neighbor as much as you love yourself. You must do what is right and good. And when you don't do what God has commanded, there are consequences. And those consequences are judgment. In the Canaanites' case, God gave them many, many opportunities to repent from their sin. God gave them many, many opportunities to turn away from their sin. They ignored their creator God and worshiped and served the creation's idols rather than the creator. And what happened? God sent the Hebrews to judge them, to kill them, because God brings the consequence of death on those who rebel against him. God has the right to judge humans and sometimes to command humans to be executed. Now, are Christians supposed to do this? No. Why? Well, we're not a nation. I mean, the Hebrews were a nation. But we're not a nation. Christians are in the kingdom of God. Kingdom of God belongs to the new heavens and the new earth that are, that are coming. Uh, when Jesus returns, Christians believe that they are going to receive, that believers are going to receive new bodies, transformed bodies. And when that happens, God's going to pour out his judgment and anger upon the whole earth and all of the nations of the earth, and they're all going to experience God's wrath and anger. But those who are in Christ, who belong to Jesus Christ, through faith in Jesus Christ as the Son of God, are going to receive brand new bodies. And Christians are already living in the hidden kingdom of God. And that means we're not going, we don't kill people. And that means that we 
pray for those who persecute us. And that means that when someone slaps us in the right cheek, we give them the left cheek. And if someone forces us to carry something for them a, a kilometer or two, we go an extra kilometer or two. Why? Because we are not Israel. We are not a part of the nation of Israel. What are we? We're in a new kingdom, the kingdom of God. That will come in our eyes to see when Jesus comes back. We'll see the kingdom of God when Jesus returns. We'll have brand new bodies. But already, we're in a hidden kingdom, and we have brand new hearts. And we don't. God doesn't use us for judging people. Well, I hope this has been helpful. The whole purpose of this lecture is to say, well, when people say, oh, well, you know, how can you believe in God when God sent the Hebrews into the land of Canaan to kill all of those people? How can you believe that God is good? And the answer is God's holy and God judges and God sent them to be his tool of judgment. Now, God's not sending me to be his tool of judgment. God sent his son, believe it or not, to be his tool of judgment because in Christ, it is true, he died for the sins of the world, but also even in the cross and his execution, the world condemned itself as hating God. Maybe they murdered his son. Okay, so I hope this is helpful. How can a loving God send the Hebrews to kill all the Canaanites? He can do it because he is the God of righteousness and holiness, as well as the God of love. The God of righteousness and holiness does judge sin. Okay, well, God bless you. I hope this makes sense. And um, if you have questions, you can always write.